Mr. President of ISSMG, Mr. Past President of ISSMG, Mr. Past President of Académie des Sciences, Mr. President of the European Federation of Foundation Contractors, I don't know who he is, Mr. President of the French Society for Engineering and Environment Geology, Mr. President of the Eurocut 7 French Mirror Committee, dear Emeritus Presidents of the CFMS, dear members of the Council and the Technical and scientific committees of the CFMS. This is the end of my formal introduction. <laughs> dear colleagues, dear friends, 20 years ago, on the instigation of Professor Pecker, who was then its president, the CFMS established an annual honorary lecture, the Coulon Lecture, to commemorate his contribution to soil mechanics. Every two years, we invite a foreign speaker. This conference is presented by a scientist from a professional or university background whose work has brought a major development in the field of geotechnical engineering, either under the theoretical aspect or under the experimental aspect, or through exceptional achievements. This is clearly the case with our speaker today, whom I have the honor and pleasure to introduce, Professor Robertson. Dr. Robertson has exceptional experience as an educator, researcher, consultant, and practitioner specializing in the areas of in-situ testing of soils, earthquake design of geotechnical structures, soil liquefaction, pile design, and soil structures interaction. Dr. Robertson is recognized as an international expert in the areas of in-situ testing and soil liquefaction. Dr. Robertson has been a consultant all over the world for projects involving liquefaction evaluation for major structures, stabilities of onshore and offshore structures, landslides, stability of slopes, deep foundations, and of course, use and interpretation of in-situ tests. In France, I've seen very frequently that as soon as you speak of CPT, the name of Professor Robertson comes into the conversation faster than the discussions about the results of the tests. <laughs> His famous abacus is in fact an essential reference for any geotechnical engineer. Dr. Robertson has authored or co-authored about 250 publications, including one book, six chapters in books, three engineering design manuals, 80 referred journal publications, and about 150 other referred contributions. In his role as Associate Vice President at the University of Alberta, Dr. Robertson was responsible for leadership in the transfer of technology to the community. Dr. Robertson has also sat on the boards of several private and not-for-profit organizations and maintains an active research program in geotechnical engineering. Currently, Peter Robertson acts now as consultant at Robertson Consultant, I think. Dear Professor Robertson, welcome in Paris, France, land of pressure meter. You now have the floor for an hour, after which the audience with, I will, will be able sorry, to ask you a few questions. Please. Well, thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, it's, it's a great pleasure uh, for me to be here and a true honor to, to be invited to give the Coulomb Lecture, and particularly at this time when it's 250 year anniversary of his major work. Uh, and it's also nice uh, to be here in Paris. I, I, I remember the first time I came to Paris about 40 years ago. I came with Professor Campanella, and I, I think we came and uh, spent a short visit with Roger Frank. Uh, just as we traveled around uh, Europe trying to, to meet uh, key players in Europe and to understand European practice. Uh, now, when asked to give this presentation, um, I uh, was uncertain what to talk about. It, the, my main drivers would have been to talk about in situ testing, but also possibly liquefaction. Uh, but then I understand you know, that liquefaction is not necessarily a major issue within France, and so I, I thought in-situ testing um, would be uh, a topic of interest, and particularly since this is the land of the Mena pressure meter, it uh, seemed obvious for me to talk about in-situ testing and maybe try and uh, in in encourage my French colleagues that you, you accelerate the movement towards CPT, because after all, <laughs> because after all, if you, if you look at your logo, your logo clearly says that this is the direction you're going. Uh, and likewise, when you look at the uh, international logo 
for the international society. Likewise, they see the future. Uh, and so it's time that we all move into the 21st century. Um, and so uh, I, my experience also is that whenever you try to promote an industry to move into a new area, invariably there's a need to look at the linkages with the things that they're most comfortable with. And when I first worked in North America, the standard penetration test was so dominant that when you tried to encourage people to do the CPT, the very first thing we did, the very first technical paper was CPT-SPT correlations. And ironically, many years later, I remember seeing a reference that said it was the most cited paper in the Japanese uh, journal. It's like, wow, just a, a small paper that I didn't think was that interesting. But of course, as a profession tries to transition from one uh, state of practice to a, uh, a more advanced state of practice, uh, then there's often a need to uh, understand the linkages so that you can take your past experience and apply it as you move into uh, new testing areas. And so, hence, the, the, the last little part, which was linked to the Maynard pressure meter. And when I did my graduate work, I looked at all areas of in-situ testing, including um, both self-boring and pre-bore pressure meters. And it was after looking at all the tests that I really began to realize that I thought the future would be with the cone penetration test for a variety of reasons. And then it was during that research that we also developed the, the seismic CPT. And so hence, I'm going to talk about the seismic CPT. And I can't really do that without first giving some sort of historical context. And so if I, if I give a brief overview, the, the first uh, mechanical cone tests were done back in the 1930s, now you know, uh, approaching 90 years ago. Uh, and they were very basic tests, uh, um, and initially started in the Netherlands. Um, and then in the 60s, the electric cone came along, and Fugro really uh, built the first electric cones commercially. Um, and it was in the 70s that they really dominated the offshore investigation. And of course, when you think of offshore work, when you take a lot of our practice onshore, uh, it, they really don't apply offshore. So the standard penetration test, for example, becomes almost impossible to do offshore. And so that's why the CPT really took off. And it was the offshore that drove then a lot of the onshore practice because of the success of what they were doing offshore. And now in the 2000s, we now deal with digital equipment. The cones are, are nearly all digital. The, the data, of course, is all digital. No longer do we deal with analog charts. We now have digital data. And that, of course, has led to the development of software because the digital data lends itself to uh, data processing using advanced software. So the, 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 the basic uh, cone penetrometer nowadays, it's a strain gauge device. It has two strain gauge load cells. Uh, the first strain gauge load cell measures the force on the tip, which when divided by the cross-sectional area gives the tip resistance in units of stress. And then the second load cell measures the uh, force of the soil as it passes the sleeve. And so it's often referred to as the sleeve friction or the sleeve resistance. And when that's divided by the surface area, gives you the frictional resistance in units of stress. And then uh, in the 70s, of course, uh, a saturated porous element was added with a pressure sensor so that you could also measure the water pressure. And from the very early days of the use of the CPT in the Netherlands, they had recognized the power of this combination of the sleeve resistance divided by the tip resistance in units of stress, which is referred to as the friction ratio. So those are the basic measurements of the tip resistance, the sleeve resistance, and the, and the pore pressure. Um, and so the early cones, of course, only measure tip and sleeve, but in the 70s, the pore pressure was added. And initially it was added on the tip, but they quickly realized that that was problematic. It was uh, often became damaged, etc. So then it migrated to just behind the tip on the shoulder, which is now referred to as the U2 location, U1 being on the tip. So the U2 location has become more popular. It's easier to saturate, it tends to respond well, and you'll see in the next slide, it gives you the measurement of the only correction that's needed in, in the CPT world. 
And the early cones were all 10 square centimeters in diameter, uh, so 35.7 millimeters in diameter. Uh, but more recently, the 15 square centimeter cone has become very popular. And I live in, in California, and California has some um, rather hard ground. It has soft rocks. And so the 15 square centimeter has become uh, the more common probe in North America. And it's pushed in with 10 square centimeter rods. So that means it minimizes the rod friction. So it actually becomes easier to push a 15 square centimeter cone than it does a 10 square centimeter, because most of the resistance actually comes from rod friction. And so uh, the 15 has become popular because it is in fact easier to, to push in for a given reaction force. Oh, and then I, I forgot that it also in, in the 80s, we added a geophone so that we could measure the shear wave velocity. So this small correction, um, so when Professor Kampen and, and I started to look at the, the, the cone, um, one of the observations that was made, and, and uh, the offshore industry, Fugo in particular, they had observed this observation, that when they lowered the cone in water, uh, you would expect that the tip resistance should equal the water pressure. But they always noted that it measured less than that. And they didn't quite understand why, they just realized it was measuring less than the water pressure. But in the offshore industry, that wasn't a major factor, because what they would do is when they got to the mud line, they would zero all the readings and everything would start at the mud line. So they would ignore the water above. And the reason they did that is the effective stress at the mud line is zero. And so, of course, the, the behavior of the soil is controlled by effective stress. And so everything is zeroed at the mud line. It just became common practice. Um, but Campanella and I always wondered, well, why is the tip resistance not measuring the correct water pressure? And of course, very quickly we realized that when you look at the cross section, the water actually acts on the shoulder of the cone because the water seal O-rings are just inside. And so the water actually acts on the back of the shoulder. And so the, the correct cross-sectional area for the water pressure is the net area. It's not the gross area. So the net area is essentially um, the, the, the diameter of the load cells. And so uh, the, in the early days, the net area was often quite small, sometimes 60 or 70 percent of the gross area. And so with this recognition now, most modern cones all have uh, net areas uh, about 80 percent of the gross area. And this small correction is made. It's only a small correction. And in SANS, uh, the correction is almost insignificant because in SANS, the, the measured tip resistance is very high, maybe 100 atmospheres, and the water pressure is very small because SANS, the penetration process is typically drained, and so the measured pore pressure is maybe only one or two atmospheres. So the tip resistance is maybe one or two hundred atmospheres, the pore pressure is only one or two, so the correction is insignificant. Now in soft clays, it becomes a little bit more important because in soft clays, the tip resistance can be very small, maybe only five atmospheres. And the pore pressure, because the penetration process in clay, soft clays, uh, is undrained, you can generate large excess pore pressures. And so this U2 pore pressure can sometimes be 80% of the tip resistance, so a big number. And so this correction, um, if, if the net area is 80%, then the correction is 20%, so 20% of the pore pressure. And so the correction ends up being approximately about 10 or 15% of the tip resistance in very soft clays. So in sands, it's insignificant. In soft clays, it can be a 10 or 15% correction. It's now very common. It's required in all standards. And uh, so uh, a, a relatively large net area is required in the standards. It's required to make this correction. So it's common that although we measure QC, uh, we actually mostly process QT, which is this corrected value. The other thing to note is that likewise the sleeve friction in the early days when they lowered cones in water, you would expect that the sleeve friction should be zero, but they always recorded some sleeve friction. And sometimes it was negative and sometimes it was positive, depending on the actual design of the cone. And of course, when you looked at the cross section, you realized that depending on the design of the cone, the sleeve could sometimes have a different area at the bottom as compared to the top. And so um, this difference in 
uh, cross-sectional area of the sleeve was resulting in a net force. And so that quickly led to the recommendation that all cones should have sleeves of equal end area so that you no longer generated this, this unequal force when the cone was immersed in water. And of course, when we push the cone into soil, when we push below the water table, it's immersed in water. And so again, an important thing, and it's required in virtually all standards now, the cones have to have a relatively um, large net area, this 80%, and that the sleeve friction should have equal end areas. So uh, that was uh, recognized about 30 years ago, and it's now international standard. When you look at pushing equipment, it's varied enormously. Um, in the early days, it was relatively small and portable, and we still have a, a wide range of, of portable equipment, and they range from as small as 10 kilonewtons up to 200 kilonewtons. You can see they come in, in multiple shapes and sizes. It's now quite common that many of them have self-anchoring systems, so that if you have 200 kilonewtons, uh, but you only have a lightweight piece of equipment uh, that maybe only is the equivalent of 10 kilonewtons, uh, then you have to anchor the system down. So many of them have self-anchoring systems to get the reaction force up to 200 kilonewtons. And of course, in um, built-up areas, so I live in Southern California, and those are uh, built-up areas of Los Angeles and, and San Francisco. And so in those urban areas, these big trucks become very popular because they're very efficient. Uh, so they're, they're mostly 200 or 250 kilonewton trucks. Um, they're air conditioned, uh, they're very spacious inside. Uh, the Greg trucks have uh, bathrooms, uh, which, is, which is good when, you have, um, when you're out in the field for a long time. Uh, and and you know, they're very extremely efficient. So you can do um, three or 400 meters a day of pushing with these trucks. They're very efficient. And of course, the, uh, uh, most of them are, are truck mounted, but of course, increasingly, some are track mounted. And here in Europe, there are, of course, these combination ones, which is a, a combination of, of wheels and tracks. And then also, um, you know, the, the cost of site investigation can be often dominated by the cost to mobilize to the site. And so ideally, you often only would like to mobilize one piece of equipment that could do everything. And so there's a growing attraction to doing CPT off the back of drill rigs so that you have the drill rig, which is capable of drilling and taking samples and doing other tests such as Maynard pressure meter. And so there's a wide range of drills and uh, many of them now are getting smaller as they become more powerful. So they're often small track mounted pieces of equipment. And the figure on the far right there shows an example of a sonic rig that has a small uh, CPT unit mounted on the back to do traditional static CPT and then afterwards to swing it out of the way and then do sonic drilling with sampling. Okay. Uh, and uh, in the offshore industry, uh, when they were in relatively deep water, um, they developed the technique of doing wireline CPT because after all, if you're in a thousand meters of water, uh, it can take a long time to lower a thousand meters of rods down. And so very quickly they realized that it was better to just uh, have the cone on a wire and drop it down the casing and have it latch into place and then push the cone out the bottom of the drill rig. Now in the offshore environment, these, these boreholes are quite large diameter and this never really caught on onshore where drill rigs are smaller and the uh, size of the casing is smaller. But in recent years now, it is beginning to catch on uh, onshore. And so uh, recently I was involved in a project where Greg Drilling did uh, wireline CPT and we were able to push to 170 meters in mine tailings. So now we're going to significant depths into quite difficult ground conditions by using these wireline techniques. And the, the, the cost uh, is quite cost effective, especially when you're going to great depth. And in the early days, often the criticism with the CPT is people say, well, the CPT is uh, a nice test, but you don't get to see the soil. Uh, it would be nice, nice to get a sample. And of course, the, the, the Dutch have known for a long time that you would like to have a look at the, the soil and get a sample. And so they, they developed uh, what are often referred to as these MOSTAP samplers. So they're pushed in with CPT equipment and they get a small disturbed sample. They're rather thick-walled samplers, so the sample is disturbed. But it's, it's uh, 
It's ideal for identification purposes and soil classification. And in uh, California, these, these uh, uh, slightly uh, more robust piston samplers are, are very popular. And so the practice in many countries now is to push the CPT. It's, it's quite quick. It's pushed in at two centimeters a second, or 200 millimeters a second. And so approximately a meter a minute. So you can do a 30 meter sounding in approximately an hour, you know, about 30 odd minutes to go down and 30 minutes to come out and move on to the next location. So a 30 meter sounding in about one hour. And so you can see you can do four or five of those in a day quite easily. But if you would like to take samples, then the practice is push the CPT. You get this continuous profile, that, which tells you a great deal about the stratigraphy. And then move over approximately a meter and then push in one of these push in samplers and then take uh, selected samples in the layers that are of most interest to the project. So in the days of drilling and the standard penetration test, where the practice was to do SPT sampling every one and a half meters. So you might come back with 10 or 15 samples, but it was possible that none of them were actually in the most critical layers. And so the practice now is push the CPT, get a detailed stratigraphic profile, move over, take a small number of samples, but in the layers that are most critical for the project. Oh, and um, to go back, and then to mention on the far right, in Australia, where they're doing work in very soft tailings, uh, they developed a, a slightly larger diameter, thin-walled, undisturbed sampler that they push in with the CPT. Now, it's pushed in closed end. It's a piston sampler. It's pushed in closed end. So it obviously creates some disturbance in front of it because it's pushed closed ended. But the sampler is a meter long. And so it's cleverly designed that when you take the sample, you go past the disturbed zone into the undisturbed zone and then bring the sample up to the surface. And then you can ignore the disturbed portion and then focus on the undisturbed portion. So in very soft soils where the pushing force is very small, then you can actually take undisturbed samples using CPT equipment. And uh, in the early days, uh, the, the common practice is that the push rods are one meter long, and so you push the cone for a meter, and then there's a pause while you then add the next rod and then continue pushing. So it's not strictly a continuous test, it's got these short pauses. Now those short pauses are actually quite helpful, as you'll see later, for measuring things like shear wave velocity or for doing dissipation tests with the pore pressure. But in some cases, it's nice to actually do continuous pushing. Um, and so uh, there are a number of systems out. The one on the left is sort of these little short rods that have an, an automatic single half twist to join the rods. And so it's fully automated. So it continually pushes and adds the rods uh, in an automatic way. And on the right is a system again, uh, modified from uh, some of the offshore industry using coil tubing. And so you have a coil tubing and it's, uh, when it goes through the thruster, it's, the, the, the rods are straightened and then they're pushed into the ground. And the, the cone has a small inclinometer to ensure that it does stay vertical, uh, but that allows continuous pushes. And then in certain areas, uh, currently in some of the mine tailings industry, where um, you may be concerned about the safety of personnel, uh, whether or not the structure is safe enough to go out there. Um, and so uh, there's a move to these remotely operated devices. The one on the left is a rather small device that Greg Drilling developed to push a miniature cone. And the one on the, the right is the Fugro one, which pushes a full scale 10 square centimeter cone up to 60 meters. The orange there is, is, is a person, so you get the sense of scale. The one on the left, the, the whole height of the device is about the height of a, of a human, whereas the Fugro one, you can see it's about three to four humans high, uh, quite a bit bigger. But fully uh, remote, it can, goes out on its own. You have a separate control cabin uh, that can uh, monitor the test. And so if we now talk about the seismic CPT, and so when Professor Caffanella and I were working together in the early 80s, um, we had heard that um, Fugro had an office in Long Beach, California, which actually had converted over to Ertec. Um, and we'd heard that they were doing push-in um, downhole seismic. 
and they were using their CPT rigs to push in a, a geophone uh, into the ground. So we went down and visited them, uh, which is quite ironic because now I live not far from that area. Uh, but we went down and visited them, saw what they were doing, and we came back and, and Dick said, you know, we could put a geophone inside a cone and we could do what they're doing, but get all of the cone data as well. And so that's what we did. So the one on the left is uh, an example of what we did. We, we, we put two geophones exactly one meter apart in the cone. So it made the probe a, a little bit longer. And so what you do is you push it and then you pause because you're going to add another rod. And then on the ground surface, if you had a horizontal beam and you hit the beam horizontally, you generate a shear wave and that shear wave will travel down and pass the cone as it travels down. And so it'll arrive at the upper uh, sensor first and then a uh, short period afterwards, it'll uh, pass the lower sensor. And so if you just take that time difference, and the distance between the two is one meter. So the velocity is that one meter divided by that time difference. A very simple test to do. And when we showed the data to various geophysical experts, they all looked at the data and said, wow, the quality of this data is remarkable. <laughs> because they were used to doing testing where they would drill a hole and then place a geophone down in the hole and then have to push the geophone against the side of the hole. Whereas, of course, we had a, a geophone that was pushed tightly inside the cone and the cone is pushed tightly inside the soil. So there's excellent contact between the geophone and the soil. So you get super high quality data. And so we did that first. And then being a graduate student, I looked at the data and said, well, you know, we could get away with just one geophone because if we had one geophone buried inside the cone, it wouldn't have to be so long. It would just be the standard length of a standard cone, which would be a you know, short distance. And then you could do the same test, but now you would stop at the first test, generate a shear wave, measure its arrival, and then push to the next depth and repeat the test, and you'd get the same result. So that was referred to as the pseudo interval because it takes two tests to do it. And the, the first one is the true interval. And when we did that, we found that the pseudo one gave essentially the same answer, but it was an easier test. It was, it was just a single geophone embedded in the cone. So it became very simple to do. Now, over time, uh, you know, because after all that was 40 years ago, ah, 40 years ago this year, uh, when we first uh, did that. And it's evolved over time. And um, uh, the, the challenge of the pseudo is you are having to repeat the test. Uh, and there are some uh, idiosyncrasies about repeating the test, uh, having a reliable trigger, etc., which I'll describe in a moment. Uh, but the, the, the true uh, interval approach is becoming popular. And this is an example. This is actually modified from Marchetti's dilatometer. And what, what the industry found is that the what, what um, Diego Marchetti had done is developed a very nice seismic module. And so the CPT industry is now realizing that, well, maybe we should just use the Marchetti um, seismic module, but attached behind a, a CPT. And so that's what's happening in various parts of the world. And they've got this rather nice diagram. So you generate a shear wave, you do true time. And so in the top right hand, you can see that the blue signal would represent the upper geophone, the red one is the lower geophone. You can see that there's a small time difference between the two. And then you use a, a cross correlation to shift the signals to find out what the time difference is. And then once you have that time difference, you can calculate the velocity. And you can do that in the field. So a single blow of the hammer and then the, the waves arrive. Uh, it immediately calculates the shear wave velocity. And then, of course, if you repeat the test, you can get a sense of the repeatability of the test. And if you do it two or three times, you get a sense of, of the repeatability and the variability. And so you can actually quantify both the accuracy and the uncertainty of the shear wave velocity. So that's, that's becoming quite popular. So if you compare the two methods, the, the true interval method has the advantage that it only requires a single shear wave source, uh, whereas uh, the, the practice, uh, at least in California, with the single geophone is you have two shear wave velocity sources. You have one on the right and one on the left so that you get a polarized signal. 
the one on the right will kick in one direction, the one on the left will kick in the opposite direction. And so you end up getting a polarized signal, you know, one that goes upwards and the other one that goes downwards. And so it's easier to identify the arrival time with the polarized signal. But two time, you only need a single shear wave source. Uh, it's independent of the seismic trigger, and you obtain the shear wave velocity directly in the field. The limitations are that it's a slightly longer probe, and of course the one meter probe was rather long, and so Marchetti has really, it's a half a meter, uh, so it's a little bit shorter, but still relatively long, it's a sizable probe, and the longer the probe is, the harder it is to push it in, because you've got more rod friction. And so if you're in hard ground conditions, the disadvantage of the true time approach, the probe is a little bit longer, it'll be a little bit harder to push in, and so for a given reaction force, you won't be able to go so deep. And if the client wishes to go to a certain depth, that could be a limitation. And so, and also, you need seismometers that have identical responses, because you've got two of them, they must have identical response characteristics. And if you're going to stack the data, so as you go deeper, uh, the, the signal becomes diminished with depth. And so as you go deeper, you can increase the quality of the data by two methods. One is you increase the gain. You basically amplify the signal by just turning up the gain. But eventually that limits out. And so one way to overcome that is to repeat the signal. So hit the beam several times and then add the data. So noise cancels out, but the signal grows in quality. Uh, but to do that, you then must have a re repeatable trigger. Now, the pseudo uh, interval approach has the advantage that the probes are much shorter. So in California, where we have hard ground conditions, soft rocks, the probe is very small, um, so it's easier to push to the required depth that you do. The downside is that it does require two seismic waves at the two different depths, and that means you have to have a fast repeatable trigger because you're, you're having to rely on two signals which ha have absolutely identical triggers. And of course, it could be challenging processing the data in the field. So the data is usually processed afterwards. So you don't get to see necessarily how good the data is until afterwards. So the true time, the advantage is you see it in the field. So the seismic CPT has the real advantage now that you've got the basic measurements of tip, sleeve, and pore pressure. And now you have the addition of shear wave velocity. And of course, if you're pushing into fine grained soils where you generate excess pore pressures, you can stop and do a dissipation test. And in the dissipation test, you record the rate of dissipation of the pore pressure. And the way to capture that with a single number is the time it takes to dissipate 50% of the excess pore pressure. And that's regarded as the T50 value. And then, of course, eventually, if you let it dissipate to equilibrium, you get the equilibrium pore pressure of U0. So you know what the groundwater conditions are. But not just where the water table is, but what the uh, piezometric profile is. I do a lot of work in mine tailings now, and in mine tailings it's quite common that the flow will be downward. So there's downward flow, so the piezometric profile is less than hydrostatic. And so it's important to do multiple dissipation tests so that you can actually determine the true uh, piezometric profile. And of course you measure slope inclination. So you've got seven measurements, and of course you can also measure P wave velocity. I mean, I was describing shear waves, but if you hit the beam vertically, you generate a, a compression wave, and so you can also measure the compression wave velocity, uh, which can help distinguish where saturation is. So here's an example of the data. So you've got tip resistance, sleeve, pore pressure, and then shear wave velocity. And then on the right is the sort of the computer generated soil behavior. So an awful lot of information contained. And you can also see on the pore pressure profile, you've got a number of dissipation tests where you'd have T50 and U0. So an enormous amount of data. And so tip, sleeve, and pore pressure, it's common now that it's recorded every uh, 20 millimeters. And so if you're doing a 30 meter sounding, you have several thousand data points and you've got three channels of it. So you truly do have thousands of data points. And as we move into a more risk-based approach where we wish to do statistics, then you're now beginning to get enough data that you can actually do statistical analysis on the variation of the parameters that you're interested in. And so when it comes to interpretation, I've got this little diagram on the left that sort of shows a generic um, sort of 
visual example of, of the interpretation. The one at the bottom illustrates that often the first thing people want to do is soil type. They want to get the stratigraphy and know what the soil is because you're not directly seeing it. So you want to know, am I in sand or clay, etc. And then, of course, you can uh, estimate the state of the soil, whether or not it's relative density or uh, yield stress ratio or OCR. You can estimate the strength, both the peak strength and the residual strength, and you can estimate the stiffness of the soil. Of course, if you measure the shear wave velocity, you're getting a direct measure of the stiffness of the soil, so you don't have to estimate it. And of course, you can estimate the consolidation and drainage characteristics. So I show an example on the right. You've got the tip resistance, pore pressure sleeve, and then here it's just an example of undrained strength, where the black is the peak one and the red is the remolded. And then uh, the last one would be the overconsolidation ratio. You notice a nice feature that underneath the tip resistance, you see color. And so in a moment, I'm going to show the soil behavior type chart. And so those have become color coded. And the color from those charts is now put underneath the tip resistance. So you can look at the cone profile and see not only the variability of the soil, but get a sense of what type of soil you're in. So the, the, the orange of, and brown, of course, is sand. And the green is, is silts and clays. And so um, uh, about 50 years ago, uh, Professor Roth, in his ranking lecture, um, he correctly said that when we're dealing with parameters, just like we heard this morning about the importance of putting units, he said, well, in, in many cases, we want to use normalized parameters so they become unitless. It doesn't matter what units they are. And they're, they're normalized, uh, normalized by the uh, effective overburden pressure so that we, it, it, it's independent of depth, so that you're using parameters that are not a function of depth. Um, and so he has suggested that simple normalization. And so uh, you know, the, the more common term now is to go from lowercase q, which is the measured tip resistance, to uppercase q, meaning the normalized tip resistance. And that would be the net cone resistance. Uh, so cone resistance minus the total overburden divided by the effective overburden. Um, and then uh, as I began to do more work in, in sands and for liquefaction, uh, the work that Peter Roth did was primarily focused on clay. And he, he, he identified that you could do this linear normalization by dividing by the vertical effective stress. And it captured all of the characteristics of clay behavior. So essentially, it was a, a direct measurement of the, the OCR of clay. But when it comes to sand, uh, that linear normalization doesn't quite work because the, the strength envelope is curved for sands. And so once you've got a curved strength envelope, you actually have to have a curved normalization. And so we suggested this uh, modified normalization. It looks a little complicated, but the first term is the net cone resistance divided by atmospheric pressure. That makes it dimensionless. And then it's got this stress correction, which is atmospheric pressure divided by the vertical effective stress to a power n. And if n is 1, it actually reverts back to the, the one that Professor Roth had suggested. And so in clays, n is 1, but in sands, n approaches about 0.5, capturing the nonlinear uh, normalization with depth. And I put in a little subtlety, you know, that sort of said, well, it's also a function of confining pressure. Uh, because the curvature of the strength envelope in sand um, diminishes with increasing overburden pressure. You know, the work by Bolton, et cetera, sort of showed that um, uh, the, the, cur the curvature of the strength envelope uh, diminishes with increasing confining pressure. So I put in a sort of a generic number to try and capture that effect. Um, and so there's a variety of normalized parameters. I've described the, the normalized tip resistance. There's also a normalized sleeve resistance, but it, it's quite popular to use a normalized uh, friction ratio. It, it's really the same as the original friction ratio, but it just uses net cone resistance uh, instead of just cone resistance. And then there's a normalized pore pressure. In the early days, BQ was suggested, which is the excess pore pressure divided by the net cone resistance, but increasingly recognizing that this uppercase U, uh, which is the, the excess pore pressure divided by the vertical effective stress. So they're all sort of normalized by the vertical effective stress. So those are the three that we uh, uh, select and, and that are becoming common practice. So when it comes to soil behavior type, um, so you know, in the mid-80s, I had suggested a simple chart, and it was based on basic 
uh, cone measurements, but very quickly realized that following uh, Peter Rose's example, we really should normalize it. So this is the normalized soil behavior type and chart, and, and this is a better way to do it because it, 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 it's independent of depth. Uh, so it works a, a lot better. But the, the other key thing is we refer to it as a soil behavior type because it's not exactly the same as many of our traditional classification systems. Traditional classification systems are based on physical characteristics of soil. Uh, essentially, the grain size distribution for coarse soils and the plasticity for fine soils. And all around the world, those classification systems are all very similar. ASTM uh, has one. But those are based on physical characteristics, which is not exactly what you would like when you want to understand the in-situ behavior. The physical characteristics do have a link to the uh, in-situ behavior, but not a very strong link. Whereas the CPT, when you push it in, it's responding to the strength, the compressibility, uh, and the stiffness of the soil. So it's responding directly to the behavior of the soil around the cone. And so hence, rather than soil, call it a soil classification system, it's really a soil behavior type system. So uh, there is a difference between traditional classification and CPT soil behavior. And so I still get emails from people around the world saying, hey, we're using your chart, but we took some samples and the samples don't agree with the chart. What's wrong with the chart? And of course, the answer is, oh, there's nothing wrong with the chart. It's just that with your sample, you're classifying them based on physical characteristics, which may not be the same as their behavioral characteristics. Most of the time, they're very similar. Most sands behave like sands. Most soft clays behave like soft clays. But of course, if you get very stiff clays, um, where uh, they're, they're very stiff, they're very strong, they actually behave more like a sand. And so the, the, the behavior type creeps up into this sand behavior, even though you would classify them as a clay. So the knowledge of both is extremely useful. And of course, I mentioned that they're color coded. And so uh, uh, an ex-graduate student of mine at the University of British Columbia hit on the idea that, well, why don't we put colors under these charts? And then we can uh, color code our, our output so that visually people could see what was a sand and what was a clay and what was a silt. And so we opted, of course, for brown for sand and Boston blue clay for clay. Uh, and then green was sort of silts. Red was saying, well, if it falls into the lower left corner, it could be highly sensitive. So warning, it's red. Uh, you need to be aware that it could be very sensitive. And Gray was saying, if it falls up into there, it's probably a soft rock. So when you get way up into that corner, you're into very hard material. Now remember, this is a log scale. It's on three orders of magnitude. So right at the lower left, you're dealing with extremely soft material. Way up in the upper right corner, you're dealing with extremely hard material. And so, uh, whoops, let's go back a bit. Oh, okay, I did. Yeah. Um, so recently I updated the charts. And um, um, so in, in 2016, I, I had a paper in the Canadian Journal. I updated the charts. And the objective of that update was twofold. One was to update the chart uh, and try to use more behavioral descriptions. The problem with the previous chart, it was a soil behavior type chart, but it used descriptions that were very common for the physical characteristics. So we called sand, silt, and clay. And in the practitioner's world, sand, silt, and clays had certain classification characteristics. And so people were confused between behavior and classification. So I wanted to move towards more behavioral descriptions. And also, I wanted to highlight the importance of microstructure. Because much of what we do we tend to treat soils as rather ideal, and the soil behavior type chart was treating them as ideal soils. But many soils in nature are not ideal. They have microstructure. Now, uh, what is microstructure is that um, microstructure is the stuff you can't see. Macrostructure is the stuff you can see, like layering and fissuring. You can visibly see those things. Microstructure is the things you cannot see. So at the particle scale, so if you have a lightly cemented soil, you can't see the cementation. You have to use a scanning electron microscope in an effort to try and see it, but you cannot see it with the eye. And if you have aging effects where the soil has been there for millions of years, um, the behavior between the particles is a little bit different. It's generally stiffer. You can't see it if you just look at the sample. 
Um, so microstructure are the things you can't see. In simple terms, they tend to be dominated by aging and cementation or bonding. So bonding and, and aging effects tend to create microstructure. And so um, by measuring shear wave velocity, what we uh, realized is that uh, most ideal soils, there is a reasonable link between the small strain behavior and the large strain behavior. So the small strain stiffness links to the large strain strength in ideal soils. So I think later we'll hear things like hyperbolic relationships for stress strain curves. So it goes all the way from small strain all the way up to large strain and there's a relationship between the two for ideal soils. So for, for ideal soils there, there is a clear link between the shear wave velocity which is a measure of the small strain stiffness and the cone resistance which is a measure of the strength of the soil. But when you get into soils that have microstructure, that relationship no longer holds. So often um, lightly bonded or aged soils are much stiffer than you'd expect them to be based on their strength. And so by measuring both, we have the ability to identify microstructure. And so we came up with this idea that uh, I put the normalized cone resistance on the vertical axis and on the horizontal axis is G0 divided by the net cone resistance. Now keep in mind that G0 is the shear wave velocity squared times the mass density and the mass density is the unit weight divided by gravity. So if you measure the shear wave velocity, you get G0, which is the small strain stiffness. And you, if you divide it by the net cone resistance, essentially it's a uh, rigidity index. It's, it's a stiffness to strength ratio. Um, and Kg, which is essentially the, the intercept of this line, uh, Kg is a normalized rigidity index. Sounds a bit complicated, but it's quite simple. And so what we found is that when we looked at uh, over 30 sites around the world, the red sites were all sites that were relatively ideal soils. They were young, uh, they, they had very little aging effect, they had little or no bonding, and they had no other, they, they had relatively uh, normal mineralogy, they were predominantly quartz materials, so they were considered ideal soils. And we knew from, uh, from many of these documented sites that they had well-behaved behavior uh, that fit most of the relationships we're used to. So those are all the red ones. And you notice they all fall within that band where Kg varies from about 100 to 300. Um, and so uh, one could argue that 100 would be extremely young deposits, recently deposited uh, uh, soils like, like mine tailings. And 300 would be the end of the Holocene era. So most of them would be Holocene age deposits. And 300 is when you start to get into uh, Pleistocene deposits. And greater than 300 is when you're in older deposits, older than Pleistocene. And then likewise, uh, uh, cemented and bonded materials fit outside. So all the black sites were, were sites that had some form of microstructure. So let's go back a bit, uh, just as a reminder. So if Kg is greater than about 200, then typically you've got uh, sort of an unusual behavior that you need to take account of. Um, and so I also updated the soil behavior type chart. The, the dashed lines was the one I showed previously. Now we've put new lines and uh, I've steepened them up a little bit, recognizing that instead of roughly circular boundaries, they're, they're hyperbolic boundaries. And instead of using uh, descriptions of sand, silt, and clay, a clay. It now says that well, soils are sand-like, or they can be clay-like, and then the stuff in between is transitional. It's transitioning from either sand-like to clay-like. Could be either one of them. Depends. And also, I introduced this wavy horizontal line that says this seems to be the boundary between soils that are contractive or dilative at large strains. And this is for ideal soils. So little or no microstructure. And so if you have a soil that is dilative at large strains, then that means in undrained behavior, the undrained strength would be larger than the drain strength. And so for design purposes, you'd like to use the drain strength. But if you've got soil that's contractive at large strains, then that means the undrained strength is less than the drain strength. And so for design purposes, you need to check stability under undrained conditions. So it's a good guiding uh, um, uh, 
criteria for engineers to look at the cone data and say, well, am I dealing with soils that are uh, contractive or dilative at large strains? So it's a, it's a nice way to capture it. So now the descriptions are, it's sand-like and dilative, or it can be sand-like and contractive, and you can have clay-like and dilative, clay-like and contractive, and then of course the sensitive region is clay-like and contractive, but also sensitive. I made the, the clay-like uh, contractive and sensitive region a little bit larger for two reasons. I needed to make it larger. It would capture more of the sensitive soils that we were observing. And I also got a little bit frustrated that people would send me emails and said, what's the equation for that curve? And I said, well, when I drew it, I didn't have an equation. I drew it by hand and I, I don't know what the equation is. And so I thought, well, I'll simply, I'd make two straight lines and no one will ask me for the equation of those lines anymore. And it's working so far. And the, the transitional material, as I said, is transitioning between the two. The other thing to take note of is when you're in the sand-like region, the cone penetration process is typically drained. So when you're pushing the cone in, typically you're not generating any excess pore pressures. The process is drained. And so the, 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 the data is ideal for estimating the drained parameters. Now, when you push into the clay-like materials in the lower right-hand corner, the, the cone penetration process is typically undrained. So now you're, you're, pu you're pushing it quite rapidly. And so there's not enough time for the excess pore pressures to dissipate. So the penetration process is undrained. And so it's ideal for estimating the undrained behavior of soils when you're in the clay-like region. If you want to estimate the drained characteristics, then you have to sort of make some sort of link to another characteristic to try and estimate the drain behavior. Um, and the transitional, again, not only is it transitional soil, but it's transitional in how it behaves with the CPT. So it's, it could be either drained or, or undrained or could be partially drained. The nice thing about measuring the pore pressure with the CPT is you know whether or not it's drained or undrained because you're measuring the excess pore pressures. So if you get no excess pore pressure and you get the piezometric profile while you push, you know it's a drained penetration. If you get excess pore pressures that are different than the piezometric profile, of course, if it's contractive, you're going to get large positive excess pore pressures. If it's dilative, you can get negative excess pore pressures, negative of, of hydrostatic. Now, of course, if shallow depth, it could be truly negative. Um, but you, you know whether or not the soil is dilative or contractive so to confirm the, the, uh, the behavior type. And of course, we color coded uh, the chart as well. Now, uh, when you get into fine grained soils, um, if you're in very soft fine grained soils, then you start to push the limit of the accuracy of some of the, the cone measurements like the tip and the sleeve, particularly the sleeve. So when you get into very soft or sensitive materials, uh, the sleeve friction can become a very small number, maybe only a few kPa. And so the accuracy of measuring the sleeve friction in these soft soils becomes difficult. And so sometimes it's nice to switch over to a chart that's more controlled by the excess pore pressure. Because when you're dealing in very soft, uh, fine-grained soils, you generate large excess pore pressures. And so often you get a very accurate measurement of the excess pore pressure when you may not be getting a very accurate sleeve friction. So these charts become quite useful. And uh, um, James Snyder with, with Mark Randolph and Paul Main had suggested this chart. I made a little modification to it and I also plotted the BQ lines on just for comparison. Um, and I also uh, added to it that you can identify where the boundary for microstructure is on this chart. So if you have an ideal soil, if you have a soft, normally consolidated clay, it plots in the lower portion of the curve, roughly with a tip resistance, a normalized tip resistance of about three and an excess normalized pore pressure of maybe about two or three. So it plots in that lower corner. And then as the soil becomes a little bit more over consolidated, the tip resistance goes up and the pore pressure goes up a little bit. But then as it becomes more over consolidated and starts approaching dilative behavior, so once you get an OCR of about four or five, it's now starting to become dilative uh, at large strains. And so the pore pressure starts migrating to the negative side. So it goes up a little bit and then migrates to the negative side. But if you have microstructure, it can keep on going. And so when you've got microstructure, you can have high tip resistance, which normally you think, oh, this must be a stiff, heavily over-consolidated soil, but you can generate large positive pore pressures. And so that's usually a warning that you're dealing with microstructure. And I'll show some examples. So I'll, I'll quickly go through some examples. 
And uh, so, uh, you know, I, I was in Vancouver at the University of British Columbia, so McDonald's farm site near the airport was out on the Fraser River Delta. So you had Fraser River sands over a normally consolidated marine clay, pretty straightforward. And it plots on the chart just as you'd expect it. The sands are relatively loose. They're sort of slightly dilated. Some of them are loose enough to be contractive. And the, the clay, it's a marine clay that's been leached. And so it's a sensitive uh, marine clay. And of course, it's young, so it fits within the bounds very nicely. If I skip a little bit now and go to an older deposit. So this is the Mattingly site in the UK, a much older deposit. And so you've got a, a relatively high tip resistance. Pore pressures are now negative. Um, and so if you go to the chart, uh, it's now plotting up into the dilative region. But now you can begin to see that that K value is beginning to creep outside of the region. It's an older deposit. It's right on that boundary of that three, 300. Uh, and what's interesting enough, at Mattingly, a lot of the traditional empirical interpretations work quite well, but it's getting close to not working. So the microstructure is beginning to play a role. Another one, if I go back to the US, now this is the Cooper Mile in the uh, um, South Carolina region. And so this is a cemented calcareous silt. And so you've got a much higher tip resistance. But you notice that although you've got a very high tip resistance and it's sort of clay-like in its behavior, uh, you get very large positive pore pressure. So now when you look at the chart, at shallow depth that plots on the contractive side, Sorry, at greater depth, it plots on the contractive side, but at shallow depth, it actually plots on the dilative side. Whereas now you can see KG is very large, warning you that there's a lot of microstructure. After all, it's a calcareous cemented silt. Uh, and now you can see the pore pressure. So although the tip resistance is quite high, you've now got significant excess normalized pore pressures, indicating that there's a warning to say, well, based on the tip resistance, I would think of this as an over-consolidated clay-like material, but those pore pressures are telling me it's contractive. So I've got a disconnect. Uh, on one hand, the high apparent over-consolidation says it should be dilative, but the pore pressure is telling me it's contractive. And the warning there is to say, yes, the microstructure is giving you this disconnect between how you think it's going to behave. And of course, what it's really saying is that at small strain, it is, in fact, relatively strong and dilative, but at large strains, it begins to collapse and generate large excess pore pressures with, with strain weakening. So if you can break the bonding, it actually becomes strain weakening. And of course, in Los Angeles, we have siltstone in downtown Los Angeles. And so it's very similar if I go to the chart now. So it shows up as a dilative silt, but in fact, the excess pore pressures are enormous. They're almost off the chart. Um, so it is a very stiff silt, silt stone, but if you were to shear it and break the bonding, it breaks down and actually is contractive at large strains and generates large excess pore pressures. So that's a quick overview. So when it comes to um, measuring the, the shear wave velocity, one of the advantages of the shear wave velocity is you get that small strain stiffness. We know the stress strain curve is nonlinear. And so the shear wave velocity gives you the the small strain shear modulus, which we used to refer to as G max, and now increasingly G zero. And so G zero is really, it's a fundamental soil parameter, uh, which is really useful to measure. So the, the cone resistance is giving you strength, the shear wave velocity is giving you stiffness. So uh, Martin Fahey and John Carter, uh, they looked at lab data, and they came up with a, a nice way of sort of capturing the nonlinearity of modulus. Uh, not as a function of strain, I'll show that in a moment, but as a function of uh, degree of loading. And so basically saying that, well, the inverse of the factor of safety is the degree of loading. And so as you more heavily load the soil, of course, the stress strain curve bends over. And so the secant modulus becomes progressively smaller and smaller. And so you, you start off at G0, but as you load the soil, that modulus uh, decays to a smaller number. And they have suggested this very simple equation with this parameter f, uh, g is, sorry, g, f is one roughly, and g is the only variable. And, and what I think the future may hold is that value g actually varies with microstructure. So with more and more microstructure, uh, the soil actually behaves more linearly. Um, so it, it approaches uh, one. <clears throat> 
And I won't go into detail. You know, I don't spend a lot of my time on foundation design anymore. But uh, uh, my good friend Paul Main, uh, he and I uh, are both big fans of the seismic CPT. We've both done work on on um, foundation design, but Paul put it together rather nicely. I don't expect you to read the slide, but but basically it says that you can get the modulus you want for design from the the shear wave velocity, and so basically you just have this <coughs> softening effect based on the degree of loading. And Paul has looked at a number of case histories. I just show two examples. And he did class A predictions and was able to get excellent prediction of the load settlement curves for, for footings. And so rather than just design for a single load, it says, oh, why not design for all the loads and actually get the nonlinear load settlement response? That, of course, provides greater insight for risk design. Because rather than just say, well, I, I did a settlement calculation, it says, no, I got the full load displacement curve and I can do a, a more risk-informed uh, design once I have a sense of the nonlinearity. So let's finally get to the bit about what the links are with the Maynard pressure meter. And of course, I, I realized I didn't show a slide of what the Maynard pressure meter is. And of course, it was like, I think, intuitively thinking, well, I'm, I'm speaking to an audience predominantly in France. And so... You all know what the Maynard pressure meter, I didn't, I didn't really need to explain it, but it, you, you drill a hole, you lower down a probe, it's got a, a, a rubber membrane on it, you inflate it, you measure the pressure to inflate it and the, the, the displacement as you inflate it. And the two big parameters you get off it is you get the, uh, the Maynard modulus, which is the, the initial modulus at relatively large strains. Um, and increasingly nowadays, you can do unload reload loops to get the unload reload modulus at intermediate strains. And various people, and Jean-Louis uh, Brio had suggested uh, correctly that the, the average shear strain around the pressure meter is roughly about a third of your measured strain at the uh, interface of the pressure meter. Um, and so the Maynard modulus is at relatively large strains, like 3 to 5 percent, and the unload reload is smaller at around 0.1 to 0.5 percent. And so the alternative way of looking at the variation of modulus is this more traditional one, which is how modulus varies with strain. The one that Martin Fahey did was looking at the way modulus varied with degree of loading which actually is intuitively quite helpful because you don't have to try and figure out what the strain is. You, you just have to figure out uh, the degree of loading. Um, and here, uh, it sort of shows that you're measuring G0. So at very small strains, you're getting that G0. And then uh, the Maynard modulus is down at quite large strains. And then the unload reload modulus is uh, more intermediate strains. And so uh, the, the promise of combining the two is that if, if you do seismic, seismic CPT being a nice approach because it's fast and inexpensive. You get the, the, the detailed soil profile and you get the shear wave velocity. So you get the profile of G0. And then if you do a number of uh, Maynard pressure meter tests, you can measure these other modulus, both the initial and the unload reload. And that in a way defines what the variation of modulus with strain is. So rather than assume some generic one, you can actually measure it. Uh, and when you're dealing with soils that have microstructure, it becomes more important to measure it rather than just to assume the variation. Uh, and then when it comes to uh, the limit pressure, uh, so uh, the limit pressure is essentially a measure of the large strain um, behavior of the soil. The, the dilemma with the, the Maynard pressure meter is you don't always reach the limit pressure. So you have to project to what you think it's going to be. So there's a little bit of uncertainty projecting. And if I go back, to, you know, as you're all aware, the problem with the Maynard modulus is it can be quite sensitive to how you uh, make the borehole. So the Maynard modulus is sensitive to borehole disturbance and the limit pressure, it really is a function of the capacity of the pressure meter and the strength of the soil. So if the soil is quite strong, you may not actually reach limit pressure and you have to project to what you think it's going to be. And here in France, you've got a number of tables. Roger kindly shared this one. And it sort of showed that that ratio between the tip resistance and the, uh, the net, the, this, no, this uh, net limit pressure, is roughly three in clays and it's up around uh, eight in sands. If you look at theory, uh, so in the theoretical world, you know, Gibson and Anderson solution uh, in clays would also kick out uh, a ratio of three, except now I'm going to normalize parameters. So the normalized tip resistance as a function of what I will refer to as the normalized 
net limit pressure. So it's the uh, net limit pressure divided by the vertical effector stress, so it becomes normalized. So I can compare it with normalized cone resistance. And it, it likewise comes out to be about three, which is what the French experience is showing. And in Sands, uh, Professor Yu looked at uh, the link between pressure meter and CPT, and he said that it was between five and 10, depending on the state of the sand. So the French experience is eight, so it's about right. So if I combine them all together, I can actually produce a chart like this and I tend to like to put them onto the soil behavior type chart. The advantage of putting correlations on the soil behavior type chart is it shows you uh, how it varies for a very wide range of soils, from very soft sensitive all the way up to soft rocks. And what it shows is the, this normalized um, limit pressure. So the net limit pressure divided by the vertical effect of stress, you can draw contours on them. They look something like that. Uh, that is, and this is for ideal soils, although it actually applies to soils with some microstructure, because after all, the limit pressure is at large strains, so it has destroyed a lot of the microstructure. So it still works reasonably well, even in soils with microstructure. And of course, the tip resistance has destroyed all the mic microstructure, so it still works. The interesting observation from my perspective is when you look at it, you see that that boundary of the uh, net limit pressure divided by vertical effect of stress of five is roughly equal to the contractive dilative boundary. So that would imply that uh, as practice, if you calculate this um, normalized net limit pressure, if it's greater than five, then you would expect the, the soil to probably be dilative at large strains and the drain strength will control. If it's less than five, it's contractive in behavior and it's likely that the undrained behavior would control. And so ho hopefully that's given you some food for thought about uh, as you move into the 21st century and start to do more seismic CPT. <laughs> now, I'm sure some of you are, are thinking that, well, the biggest criticism of, of the CPT is you can't push it into all soils. And that's true. That is one of the big advantages of the Maynard pressure meter is you can do it in a wide range of soils. The difficulty with the main hour pressure meter, of course, in very soft soils, it's problematic because the soils don't hold a borehole. You have to push it in and disturbance becomes an issue. And in very hard soils like rock, uh, it becomes problematic because the compliance of the membrane uh, dominates the results. And so the sweet spot for main hour pressure meter is sort of stiff soils that you can form a very nice borehole and you get excellent uh, main hour pressure meter results. And that sweet spot sort of overlaps uh, with the CPT. The CPT can be used in very soft materials, but it limits itself in very hard materials. Its ability to operate in very hard materials is a function of the push force. So if you, if you can get the 200 or 250 kilonewtons in reaction force, then you can push into very hard soils. So in, in, in Southern California, we push into these soft rocks all the time. I, I showed you data in siltstone. <laughs> So we're pushing into these soft rocks quite, quite frequently. And so we are pushing the limits of harder and harder soil. The only real dilemma that you have is if you get into gravels. Gravels become a major problem. If it's a, a gravel that's floating in a matrix of sand, then you can push the cone quite successfully. However, if it's nearly all gravel and it's coarse gravels and co cobbles, then you'll hit refusal and it becomes a problem. And the, the, the Maynard has the ability that you can drill a hole and do some tests. Uh, but if you're going to do that, um, shear wave velocity is still a nice thing to measure. And so actually doing surface geophysics like MASW to get shear wave velocity profile is a useful addition. So in California, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a, a, a consultant to Greg Drilling. And a, a, Greg Drilling has a main eye pressure meter and, and does pressure meter testing. Um, and so often when, when clients are asking for pressure meter testing, I often ask them and said, have you done CPT first and have you done seismic? Uh, because of course, if it's soft, it says, well, you should do CPT first because then you'll know what the stratigraphy is and you'll know where you want to do the, the pressure meter testing. If, if the ground is very hard and not suitable for CPT that says, well, have you done geophysics? So you've got the variation of G0 with depth. So that again, you know where to focus, where you want to do your, your pressure meter testing. So rather than do pressure meter testing at every depth interval, you select the layers at which you would like to do it. And that's partly because in, in North America, 
site investigation is extremely competitive and cost sensitive. And so cost tends to dominate. And so the ability to, to maximize the data for the minimum amount of, uh, of uh, money is, becomes important. So in closing, so in the last 40 years, there's been significant developments in the seismic CPT. I've hopefully hit some high points for you. Um, the, the, the real advantage is that it's one of the few tests that will give you seven measurements in one test in a cost-effective manner that's near continuous. Um, the, and hopefully I've highlighted the important role of uh, microstructure. It becomes uh, increasingly important to both recognize it and to identify it. And then uh, I've touched on the importance of nonlinearity. We, we know that soils are nonlinear in their behavior. And so uh, measuring shear wave velocity gives you some guidance on how to do that. And uh, as I touched at the end, this combination of surface geophysics, such as MASW, uh, which gives you a two-dimensional profile of shear wave velocity uh, with depth, and then combining that with seismic CPT and or pressure meter uh, can provide valuable insights both into the microstructure uh, and the nonlinear behavior of the soils. So thank you for your time and I'm, I'm certainly happy to take any questions. So we have uh, about Dans la lumière. Oh, pardon, je me mets dans la lumière. Hop. We have got 50 minutes to answer questions. I have one right at the front here. Yes. Please introduce yourself before asking. Hello. <laughs> nice to see you again. Nice to see you again. After so many years. Yeah. <laughs> um, of course, your lecture was devoted to the CPT, and, and that was very, very well centered. But uh, it would have been interesting to see some comparisons between the uh, velocity profiling provided by the CPT in comparison to in-hole uh, classical tests like, uh, uh, like uh, cross-hole or down-hole tests, especially at not at shallow depth, at, at non-shallow depth, if, if you can comment on that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, you know, for, for time restrictions, I didn't want to spend too much time on the comparison because you know, the seismic CPT has been around for 40 years. So in the early days, a lot of comparison work was done. And generally, the comparison is very good. However, <laughs> there are catches to it. And, and the, the two big catches are, one is that um, the, the shear stiffness of soil depends on the direction of loading. So if you shear it one way, it can be slightly different than if it's sheared the other way. And with, with shear wave velocity, so the traditional shear wave velocity is you put a beam on the ground surface, hit it horizontally. So the wave uh, propagates vertically and the motion is horizontal. And if you do cross hole, it's possible that it's the other way. Now, for a lot of soils, the difference between those two may be only 10%. But in some soils, it can be more significant. Uh, and so there was work in the UK on some of the older um, uh, clays in the UK. And these older deposits, they were finding that this um, stiffness anisotropy was more significant. And so there was a difference between whether or not you measured it vertically propagating or horizontally propagating. Now, of course, one of the ways around it is in the borehole, you can do it horizontally propagating if you want to. <laughs> so so you, you, you've, you've got a GVH or a GHH. Uh, so life gets complicated when you do it, but you, you need to have an awareness that there is a difference and that the issue is which one do you need for your project. Now, since I work a lot in seismicity, it's actually the, the one that the CPT is giving you is the one you often uh, would like because it's, it's duplicating the seismic waves from an earthquake. You know, it's a vertically propagating wave with horizontal motion. So hence, it becomes uh, the one you're often more interested in. But the question is good, is you need, to, you need to realize that they're not exactly the same. But for ideal soils, you know, with little or no microstructure, they're within 10% and uh, it's not a big issue. Soils with significant microstructure, there can be a bigger difference. The other point that you touched on is the influence of depth. So with the seismic CPT, uh, the, the source is at the surface. So obviously the deeper you go, 
the, the source diminishes in its signal. So the, so the deeper you go, the signal gets weaker and weaker and weaker. And so the sweet spot for CPT is it doesn't work very well in the upper two to three meters. And that's because um, uh, you know the, the, the cone is at very shallow depth, the, the, the source is offset a short distance, only a short distance, but if you're only a short distance down, the, the angle is not vertical, it's coming in and inclined, and so you get reflection and bouncing. So the signal tends to be messy in the first three or four meters. Once you get to about five meters, the signal becomes very clear. So from five meters down, it's good. The upper five meters, not so good. Now, once you go deeper, the signal diminishes, and by the time you get to about 50 to 60 meters, the signal is diminishing significantly. And so beyond 60 meters, seismic CPT starts to get out of its range. Now, there are ways around it. You can stack the signal, which slows it down. So you have multiple hits, and you collect the data and keep stacking it higher and higher. But 50 to 60 meters, you start pushing the limits. Um, now, traditional methods, cross hole, uh, becomes problematic at great depth because uh, the boreholes don't stay vertical. So they, they start to move as you go deeper. So you have to use inclinometers to know exactly where they are and calculate the exact distance. So it, it gets expensive. Uh, but when it comes to very deep boreholes, um, PS logging becomes very popular. So th these are downhole devices that measure both P wave and shear wave velocity in hole in a device. Now the device is quite long. It's several meters long, three meters long. It's a very long probe. And so the PS logging is not very good in the upper 30 meters because the probe itself is so big and cumbersome. But once you get past about 50 meters, it becomes very useful. And so what you tend to find is seismic CPT extremely useful in the upper sort of 50 meters and PS logging becomes very popular below 50 meters because it's more cost effective and more, more reliable. So that's the way the industry has gone. And um, surface seismic like MASW, very good in the upper 50 meters. Once you get past 50 meters, it becomes problematic. You have to use extremely low frequency waves to go down there or passive waves. And uh, MASW suffers also that the interpretation is not unique. So you don't know exactly if you got the right interpretation. So combining MASW with seismic CPT, where you measure the shear wave velocity with the CPT, and then combine it with the MASW to improve the interpretation of the MASW. So the two in combination. Thank you. Sarah. Thanks so much. Um, Sarah Springman, um, previously ETH, now in Oxford. Um, love the lecture. Thank you so much, Peter. Absolutely fantastic. Um, when working in deep post-glacial clay deposits that are varved, which have uh, clay and thin silt layers um, in them, and you're trying to build on these, say, big embankments, then the natural sums you do are that the dissipation will be a function of the, the depth squared. But of course they aren't because the lateral drainage can be incredibly efficient. So I was fascinated to see the five um, uh, um, square, centimeter uh, square centimeter cone and the 10 and the 15. We did some work in some um, glacial, uh, some of these very normally consolidated deep um, clay layers and found that the five centimeters squared uh, cone was brilliant at picking up these very fine layers, which would help you to understand how quickly the excess pore pressures might be dissipated. So my question to you is, seeing now we're going to the 15 uh, uh, centimeters squared, is, is there a problem in terms of sensitivity in detecting those layers that might give somebody who's designing something and wants to know how quickly consolidation will advance? Um, is that a, a, a problem that we should be worried about, or is it all okay? Thank yeah, you. yeah no, uh, another good question. Um, yeah, so you, you get to this issue of scale effect. And so the, the, the cone um, basically creates a zone of influence around it. It's roughly spherical, so it's sensing ahead and behind as the probe is being advanced. And the size of that zone of influence is a function of the stiffness of the soil and the size of the probe. And so in very soft soils, the zone of influence may only be about two diameters of the probe. But in very stiff soils, like sands, it can be 10 diameters of the probe. 
So, of course, the bigger the probe, the bigger the zone of influence is. And so the bigger the zone of influence is, is that when you encounter thin layers, it tends to smear those thin layers because it's sensing such a large area that if the thickness of the layer is quite small, it senses that the layer is there, but it'll only show it as a little spike. So, for example, if you had a thin sand layer in a soft clay, you'll pick up a little spike. So you'll know that something's there, but it'll just be a little spike, and you won't know exactly what it is. You know, you, probably a sand, but it could be a silt, and I don't know how dense it is because I just got a little spike. And so the smaller the probe, of course, the smaller the zone of influence, and the bigger that spike is. And so when you get into thinly bedded deposits, small diameter cones become useful because they pick up these spikes a little bit better. But in the end, of course, it comes to practicality because uh, the, the Dutch chose 10 square centimeters because of the very practical size. It was a rather robust probe, etc. The 15 becomes attractive when you have hard pushing. So we're not dealing with thinly layered soft deposits. We're dealing with hard sandstones, siltstones, and claystones. So the big cones are very nice. But if you're dealing with soft deposits like varved clays, where you're concerned about the thinness, then smaller cones have an attraction. So now you're dealing with um, a site investigation where ideally you want a contractor that has the suite of equipment that can push the big cones and the small ones. And again, I mentioned earlier about the, the usefulness of the push-in samplers. And so, of course, you, you push a regular cone, you get your regular profile, and you'll see these little spikes. And if you're in a glacial environment, you might say, ah, well, we're in a clay, but these little spikes... Uh, it might be a, a thinly layered clay, and, and we, sh we should take a sample of this and have a look at it. And so, of course, you move over, you, put, you take a couple of samples, you bring it up, you get them out, and, and, and you cut the sample, and you look very carefully and maybe let it dry out very quickly, and you go, ooh, we've got these little thin silt lenses uh, that could be a problem. Um, if the project is important, then you might say, well, let's, let's do a couple of small diameter cones and just see uh, how important they are uh, in relation to the dissipation test. And you're right about the rate of consolidation. It's a function of the length of the drainage path. And often people will say, well, I've got a thick clay deposit, so the drainage path is very long. But it says, yeah, but the cone says, I've got all these little spikes. These little spikes are telling me I've got little sand and salt lenses, so the drainage path may be much, much smaller than I thought it was. And the cone will tell you that. Thank you. Roger Frank, uh, Ecole des Ponts, uh, France. Um, uh, thank you for your very interesting uh, uh, presentation. Uh, speaking about the measurement of stiffnesses in, in situ, measurements of stiffnesses, one of my hobbies, I try to have it another, as an hobby. Uh, you, the few words you said about the MENAR modulus were rather kind, <laughs> on the kind sides. On the kind side. I didn't want to be too critical. <laughs> <laughs> you you, we agree that you could have been more critical. Okay. Uh, they were on the kind side. Uh, let's speak about the cell boring pressure meter. I think you, you must have some experience of comparing yep. the G0, yep. G0 yep. Uh, with the seismic CPT and the cell boring pressure meters. Yep. Probably, uh, I remember speaking about that with you, probably most likely, where you went, when you were still in British Columbia. Didn't yep. you work on that subject then yep. and since? What happened? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I mean, um, what's interesting is the self boring pressure meter where they're using instrumented arms. And of course, in the early days, it was two arms, then it went to four, then it goes to six, then it goes to eight. Uh, and, and the reason for that is when you had two arms, the two arms weren't exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> so they're like, oh, okay, what do we do now? So I said, well, we'll take the average. And they said, well, maybe we should go to four and get a better average. And then they realized, well, maybe eight would be better. So it's pretty complicated. Uh, and of course, as these arms become more sensitive, when they do unload reload loops, they, of course, are able to look at the data in, in great detail. And of course, they realize that the unload reload loops are nonlinear, as you'd expect. Um, so they, they, they don't come down exactly as a single value. They curve down and curve back up. Um, and so, uh, as more people have done research, it says, yes, yeah, so um, we, we catch the curvature as it unloads and, and reloads, and we know what the strain is, so we can come into these degradation curves and actually plot the 
degradation of modulus with strain. And so you, you, you peg it with G0 and say G0 gives me my starting point. And if I do unload reload loops, I don't get just a single value. I can actually get a range of values that covers a range of stress. So I've, I've got a portion of the curve. Um, and so I would like to get the whole curve, but now I'm getting a portion of it from the unload reload loop with, with very sensitive equipment. And I've got the anchor point of G0. So I can get the whole degradation curve by just filling in the gap in between. And that, that, that seems to be the pragmatic approach. The difficulty is, of course, is that those probes are sophisticated and complicated. And uh, in the early days, what we found is the probe was in the lab being repaired and calibrated more than it was in the field because it was so complicated and so sophisticated. And so as, as a pragmatic engineer, I'd say, you know what? Seismic CPT is very attractive. <laughs> it does not go into the lab for recalibration very often. You just push it in, you get the results. It's very, very okay, pragmatic. That, that same method of measuring the volume changes in the same volume. Yeah. And there's all these uh, gauges, etc. Yeah. Yeah, you've got two approaches. You measure the volume, as in the, the, the Maynard, or, or the gauges, as in the, uh, sort of the, the, the British self-boring pressure meter, or, or, or the British pre-bore pressure meter. They, they both use gauges. There's pros and cons between the two. Obviously, the gauges are more complicated. Uh, the volume is a little bit easier. Uh, but the volume, of course, you've got to assume it's a, 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 a right cylinder, which you can uh, correct for, etc. Nothing's perfect. Yeah. I know there's one more question. We'll hopefully uh, have time. Last one. You needed a short answer, please. Well, that's that's the problem. The the, the questions are short. The answers are long. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, hello, Peter. So I'm Jean-David Verne from uh, Unilassal in Beauvais, small city in the north of Paris. Uh, so as we're paying a tribute to Coulon, uh, we still use a lot Coulon's cohesion and friction in laboratory testing. Have you ever tried to find a correlation between your in-situ testing and laboratory testing? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, again, in the, in the interest of time, we couldn't possibly cover it. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I've been involved in in-situ testing for over 40 years. And so this issue of comparing lab testing with in-situ testing uh, arises frequently. And uh, the, the challenge is, is almost always, of course, uh, sample quality because the in-situ test is being done in situ in the, in the natural conditions. And when you're dealing with microstructure, it's capturing the in-situ behavior with the microstructure. When you deal with lab testing, you've got to get the sample from the lab, from, from the field into the lab. And so the issues of sample disturbance you know, really dominate. And uh, you know, uh, we did a major research project in Canada, of which I, I was the lead, and it was the Canlex project, which was the Canadian liquefaction, where we did ground freezing to get undisturbed samples of sand. So we spent a lot of time, a lot of money to get high quality undisturbed samples of sand using ground freezing, and then taking them to the lab and doing extensive lab testing. And one of the things we learned from that, particularly in sands, is sands are highly variable um, by nature, by the way they're deposited and on the scale. And so what we saw is when you got a, a frozen sample, when you looked at the sample, you could immediately see that the void ratio varied around the sample. So if you took little cubes and took the void ratio, you didn't get a single answer. They, it varied all over the sample. And what we found is when we did lab testing, we got a, a fairly wide range of response uh, from our samples because the behavior was very sensitive to small changes in void ratio. And so what you found is comparing lab data with field data becomes quite problematic because in the field data, you've got lots of data, thousands of data points, and the lab, much less. It's more expensive, etc. So you have a, a limited number. And so what I encourage people to do is when you compare the two, you want to take the lab data results and superimpose it over the top of the CPT. So let's say, for example, uh, you're, you're interested in the OCR of a clay. And so you're going to do uh, good quality sampling. You do some odometer tests or, or constant rate of strain consolidation tests to get the yield stress. And then you, you've, you've got a handful of numbers from your lab testing. Is then rather than try and plot X, Y, you know, the OCR from the field and the OCR from the lab, it says, no, the cone profile shows you what the OCR is as a vertical profile, and then place the lab data over the top because the cone profile is capturing the soil variability. So how it varies due to stratigraphy, et cetera. And so when you get a scatter in your lab data, 
by overlaying it over the CPT, it provides insight into that variation. So rather than just say, oh, I did 10 lab tests and I get a range of results and my mean value is this and my standard deviation is another number. It says, no, put it over the profile and the profile captures the stratigraphy, which gives you insight into the variation. So um, it's, it's a short answer to a, a longer question. Thank you. It, it was the last question, so the, the, the very last question. Uh. <laughs> Uh, congratulations again for your excellent presentation. I have a very uh, quick question. Well, actually, uh, they are two. I don't know if I can try. <laughs> One is related to the fact that uh, empirical correlations uh, um, are developed uh, using uh, most of the time the standard the size uh, of the cone. And I wonder whether, since these are empirical correlations, they're applicable also when you are using actually different size of the cone. And the very uh, quick question, the other one is related to the fact that one of the reasons the pressure meter test to me is very insightful is because there is a theory behind the interpretation, the expansion of a cavity. How far we are with the CPT of interpreting the test, not via yeah. empirical correlation, but say through the simulation with a yeah. finite element uh, model, the penetration of the yeah. test, thank you. No, that, that's a very good question. And you are correct that uh, most people perceive that the interpretation of the CPT is empirical. But what many people don't realize is all of them are based on often sound theoretical solutions. Now, in the early days, they were all totally empirical. But over time, as our theoretical understanding has improved, nearly all of the interpretations are based on theoretical basis. They all have a framework of which it says, the, the, the theoretical understanding says the, the, the correlation must have this form. And so we've gone out in the field and we've, we've checked what the values of the constant star in the form. But, but it has a basis in, in uh, theory. And in fact, uh, the most common theory for, for cone penetration, for the tip resistors, is in fact cavity expansion. And so with the pressure meter, of course, it's cylindrical cavity expansion. And for the cone, spherical cavity expansion is one of the most common ones. And there's been a lot of work on, on spherical cavity expansion, um, you know, creating the form of the correlation and then field data verifying that it works. Of course, we've moved on and we, we've now got finite element analysis, advanced numerical, multipoint uh, methods, etc. A, a lot of theoretical work has been done that, that confirms that the, the correlations we use do have a theoretical basis. They're not purely empirical. But my warning is, is most of them are done on ideal soils, where a lot of soils have some microstructure. So the warning is to say, yeah, they work well, but they don't always work. And that's true for the, the Maynard pressure meter too, which is to say, yes, it has a theoretical basis on, on cavity expansion, but most of those theories are based on ideal soils, whereas real soils can have microstructure where the stress-strain relationships aren't exactly what you have in your theory. Thank you.